now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Good Friday. Welcome to Crime Classics. From 69 years ago, October 28, 1953, John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. And we thank you for tuning in on this Friday, 28th day of October, 301st day of the year, 64 days remaining. Christopher Columbus landed in Cuba on this date in 1492. Uh, Thomas Edison applied for his first patent, the electric boat recorder, in 1868. In New York Harbor in 1886, Grover Cleveland, uh, President Cleveland, uh, dedicating the Statue of Liberty. In 1919, the Congress passed the Volstead Act over President Wilson's veto, paving the way for prohibition to begin the following January. That was in 1919. 1936, President Roosevelt rededicated the Statue of Liberty on its 50th anniversary. When the Statue of Liberty had her 50th birthday celebration, Europe's dictators were on the rise and World War II was just three years away. The speeches at the statue stressed that liberty was on the defensive, threatened once again. In those menacing days, President Franklin D. Roosevelt said he still held to the faith that a better civilization than any we have known is in store. Stately gray warships in the harbor fired the 21-gun salute as the president's vessel passed by, but he chose to make the trip in an ordinary city ferry boat. Robert Trout, ABC News. President Franklin Roosevelt on this date in 1936. Elvis receiving a polio vaccination on national television in 1956. The Cuban Missile Crisis, Soviet Union leader Nikita Khrushchev announced in 1962 he had ordered the removal of Soviet missile bases in Cuba. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet Prime Minister re-emphasizes the need for urgent measures to prevent a fatal turn of events and to preserve world peace. In addition to instructions earlier transmitted to stop construction work on installations in Cuba, the Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their crating and return to the Soviet Union. The end of the Cuban Missile Crisis on this date in 1962. In St. Louis on this date in 1965, the Gateway Arch completed. It was on this date in 1986, the Statue of Liberty dedication celebrated in New York Harbor 100 years later, 1986. NASA successfully launching the Ares 1X mission, the only rocket launch for its later canceled Constellation program in 2009. Passing away on this date in history, the mother of John Quincy Adams and the wife of President John Adams, Abigail Adams, country singer Porter Wagner, and Dano from the original Hawaii Five-0, James MacArthur. Birthdays today include uh, Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine. Also, uh, Nick Yamana on Barney Miller, Jack Sue. Uh, Charlie Daniels of the Charlie Daniels Man, who talks a little bit about the devil, went down to Georgia. There was a, a poem in a book, in my literature book in ninth grade, I think it was. It was Stephen Mrs. Binet poem. It was about a fiddle contest, and uh, I got one of my old teachers to send me a copy of it. But I kind of found out I couldn't use it or I would be sued by his estate. So I didn't use it, but I think it just got me thinking along those lines about a fiddle contest. Of course, I had nothing about devil fiddling in the contest in the poem, but evidently it got me thinking along those lines. I thought it was a real good piece of work, and I remembered it. I couldn't say it verbatim or anything. You know, it was something I remembered, uh, remembered the story of it, and it was something that stuck with me all through the years. Charlie Daniels, born on this date. He passed away in 2020 at the age of 83. And uh, English singer Wayne Fontana. Who wrote the game of love, the mind menders, who also passed away last year at the age of 74, or in 2020, rather. 
Uh, this is the birth date of Susan Harris, the lady responsible for soap, Benson, Golden Girls, and Empty Nest. She's 82 today. Uh, Sipowitz from NYPD Blue, Dennis Franz is 78. From Tony Orlando and Don, Telma Hopkins is 74. Uh, Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, 73 years of age today. From Ghostbusters and Designing Women, Annie Potts is 70. Bill Gates is 67 today. We're not, we're not like an alligator. We don't go around and eat things. <laughs> we come out with these little boxes, these nice little software packages, and you stick them in your computer, and you either have fun using it, and it helps you get things done, or not. Bill Gates, 67. Princess Vespa in Spaceballs. Daphne Zuninga is 60 years old today. From Picket Fences and Dumb and Dumber, Lauren Holly, 59. From Lost Boys and Less Than Zero and Square Pegs, Jamie Gertz, 57. Julia Roberts, 55. Country's Brad Paisley is 50. Hoquin Phoenix, 48. The 11th Doctor Who, Matt Smith, is 40. From Pretty Little Liars, Troyan Belisario is 37. And from Modern Family, Nolan Gould is 24. Those just a few of the people celebrating the 28th day of October as their birthday. And if this is your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! From 69 years ago, October 28, 1953, crime classics. John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. And we'll explain how when Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues on this Friday. You know, a lot of times you have to choose between something high quality or something that saves you money. But if you can get both, why not? Especially when it comes to health care. And that's MediShare. You get both. The typical family saves 500 bucks a month switching to MediShare. And that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. It's because MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge PPO network. So, yeah, really, you could save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. If you're self-employed or part of the gig economy, or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. Here is the number you need. Call 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. So Elliot Lewis and his crew created crime classics and based it on great crimes of the past. And this crime took place in uh, 1725 as uh, Catherine Hayes uh, killed her husband. And he, it was uh, one of those marriages that, uh, eh, you know, uh, the husband became a successful pawnbroker. She had 12 children. She would later claim her husband was abusive, kept her isolated from church, and murdered some of her children. All righty. In 1725, uh, a couple of, well, you'll hear how it all came about in this episode of Crime Classics on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, originally broadcast October 28th, 1953. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. The glass you just heard broken was not ordinary glass. It was a closed vessel of exact contour of the man's head which it held. It was raised exactly one millimeter above the skin, all around, and above the hair. No small feat, since the hair on the head was lush and curly. Another masterpiece by Dom Llewellyn, whose secret of blowing glass to enclose human heads died when he died. Dom Llewellyn had been called in to do a job of work on what was left of Mr. John Hayes, which was all above the neck. So tonight, my report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, 
connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The 18th century was only a few years old, and the town was Warwick, and the season was spring. Things were budding all around, trees, flowers, and there happened to be a 16-year-old girl named Catherine Hall. She appears suddenly in history, this girl, walking down the road. Suddenly, because nobody knows what parentage put her there. Isn't that nice? A young girl swinging down a road in May. tra la 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 Skipping. Stops. Uh, together nuts. And alongside her, three soldiers, officers of His Majesty's Dragoons, and gentlemen. Gentlemen three, and guardians of Catherine. And Lieutenant Ombersley has the papers in his bandolier to prove it. Guardians and their ward at a crossroad. Catherine? Yes, Uncle? Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and I think the time has come... For what, Uncle? The time has come... Do not be shy... How is it that always you're shy when the sun shines? We have a wedding gift for you. Uncle. From all of us to you. Uncles. The gift, here. A scarf. Uncles. We'll miss you. And I, you. And the time now to tell you of him, of the man you'll marry. Of the man who comes down this road anon to take you from us. From Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and myself. Is he as tall as you? He is very rich. Is he as handsome as Uncle Ned? He is very rich. Oh, and has he the strength of Uncle Fred? He is very rich. Then I know I shall love him well. Catherine. Yes, Uncle. Your duty is as wife. Yes, Uncle. Always water in the pail and loving nuptials cannot fail. And? Happy marriage in a springtime day, child in the cradle on New Year's Day. Oh, yes, Uncle. Oh, yes, Uncle. Uh, he is prompt. I die with impatience. He has a fine span of horses, see? Oh, trembling. Oh, John Hayes. Oh, you girl. If your name be Catherine, get in. Uncle? Get in, girl, get in. A kiss, Uncle, for farewell to you and Uncle Ned. Which we did in tears and kisses the whole night past. Get in, girl, get in. Here's your money, Lieutenant. Small sackful, as was contracted for. Giddy up! night, these impetuous 18th century lovers, these young people, Catherine Hall and John Hayes. History records that it was a rather hectic marriage. Uh, the groom's father went temporarily blind from drink before the ceremony. Uh, there was unruliness among the servants, and some sources state that the bride herself tried to sneak off and had to be restrained. But married they were just as evening sun went down. And that evening, after the house of John Hayes had quieted down, after the pig had been eaten and the toast drunk, after the celebrants had gone home and the windows bolted and the doors barred, after all these things... <laughs> there you are! There you are! Come on out now! <laughs> there you are! Liberty bird! You know what you ought to do. <sighs> what? Join the army. Join the army? Join the army. Uh, why should I do that? I'd be so proud of you. <laughs> Aren't you proud of me now? Think of you in a uniform. Oh, I, I never did. Well, then let's do it. Uh, all right. The scarlet trousers and the scarlet coat. Oh, my. And the golden sash and the gleaming scabbard. And I'd stand up straight like this. On your curly hair, a three-cornered hat and a cockade. And I'd march. And I'd march. And perhaps... Uh, what? They'd send you to America. Yes! No. 
You would volunteer for it. Oh, no. You'd miss me too much. You'd suffer. Oh, I'd write to you every day. Well, the boats to America do not sail very often. I'd knit things for you and bake things for you, but mostly... What? I'd be proud, oh, so proud, dear John. Well, I don't know. I... Join the army. <laughs> proud? Oh, yes. <laughs> what would you do? Oh, tell people, <laughs> uh, John. Yes, Golden sash and gleaming scabbard, and on your head a three-cornered hat with a cockade, John. And you'd march so straight and tall, you'd march... Um, like this? Yes. Like this? Yes. Oh, yes. Dear Father, I am writing this letter to tell you that I have just come back from a 20-mile march under full pack, and I do not like it. In the six months I have been in the army, I have not found a thing that I like about it. It is march, 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 march. In spite of my education, I am still but a grenadier. Two of the lads who joined the army with me are lieutenants and wear cockades, so please... Dear Father, present the government with twenty pounds and secure my release from this life. I would do it with my own funds, but I had wisdom enough to assign my wealth to my wife's name before joining the army. I do not wish to bother Catherine in this matter, as I am going to surprise her by my appearance in civilian garb and put an end to her loneliness. Please, Father, do me this favour, your loving son, John. Oh, P.S. Please, Father... Just consider it alone. <laughs> that curious tailor from Tottenham. <laughs> Mr. Wood, you're the one. And how about me? Oh, you're a one too, Mr. Billings. You're... If it's the butcher boy, Mr. Wood. Yeah, I'll send him on his way. All right. Who are you? Who are you? I am John Hayes. Who? John Hayes. Oh, you be in the army. Oh, not now. I am John Hayes, and I've come home to my wife. Where is she? Uh, Catherine! Who is it? Catherine! Catherine, I'm home! Dirty deserter! No! Oh, shame! Well, listen, I'm out of the army! But you cannot be! I just sent you a sweater! I'm out! M my father paid a bounty for me, and I'm home again. Who are these men, Catherine? I'm, uh, Billings, the cooper. I be Wood. The alehouseman. Tradesman? I. Well, what do we need a cooper and an alehouseman here? Are you questioning me, husband? Well, I'd like to know why a cooper and an alehouseman... Welcome home. I welcome home. Ready here. Come to home. Drink a cheer, boy. Run to here, oh, come to home. Run to here, oh, come to home. 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 <laughs> oh, oh, husband. Oh, dear wife. I was so proud of you when you were gone. And you told people. Oh, yes. Drink a cheer. Yeah. Drink a cheer. <laughs> <laughs> and now, wife. We will celebrate you and me and Mr. Billings and Mr. Wood. Well, I Happy thought. thought. We'll have a celebrate. John, you're dusty from the road. Go wash. There's a full pail, always a full pail, always waiting for your return. Go wash. Uh, uh, yes. Mr. Wood. Hi, Katie. Mr. Billings. How did you come to marry such a one, Kate? He's very rich. And he's come home. His wealth is assigned in my name. I receive it but in driblets. Mm, poor lady, shame. If I were a widow... The money? All at once. All mine. Billings? Aye. 
Let's make a widow. And uh, how to do that? You kill an husband, you make a widow. Paint that an axe above the fireplace? Oh, dear friends. I washed Catherine. I was proud. Ruddy hero. <laughs> A soldier had come home to his wife, to his neighbors. There was wine in the room and a good fire. But it was one of the shortest celebrations on record. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. So there you have the setup of what's about to happen on this episode of Crime Classics as it was broadcast October 28, 1953 over CBS. We'll have the news from 69 years ago today along with the conclusion of Crime Classics and how all of the murder actually takes place. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox right here on your favorite station. Back in a moment. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. An episode of Crime Classics, John Hayes, His Head, and How They Were Parted, as it was broadcast Wednesday, October 28, 1953. In the newspapers of that Wednesday, some 69 years ago, these were some of the headlines. Secretary of Defense Wilson, seconded by Secretary of State Dulles, said today the U.S. has no immediate plans for withdrawing troops from Western Europe. On the heels of their statements, France's Deputy Foreign Minister Maurice Schumann announced here that he was definitely satisfied that America's contribution to the European defense line will not be weakened. Doubts arose in France and other free nations of Europe last week after Wilson commented publicly that development of the new weapons would permit a reduction of U.S. troops in Europe in the long run. U.S. Special Envoy Arthur Dean told Red Delegates the Chinese and North Koreans were free to invite Russia to the Korean Peace Conference because the Red Forces, quoting, were equipped with plans, tanks, guns, and munitions sent from the Soviet Union. Arthur Dean, representing the United Nations, declared at the third session of the preliminary peace talks, the Soviet Union has openly supported your side by word and deed. Israel unexpectedly offered today to suspend work on its Jordan River hydroelectric project and promised full cooperation with the Security Council in its efforts to settle the issue. Syria complains the project diverts water from Syrian farms. The Israeli move came shortly after the UN truce supervisor in Palestine, Major General Van Benke, warned the council that serious trouble was ahead in Palestine unless cooler heads prevailed and the 1949 armistice agreements were strictly followed. <laughs> Secretary of Agriculture Benson capped a two-day demonstration of cattle growers clamoring for price props by asserting today that the nation's livestock industry is overwhelmingly opposed to rigid supports. Benson told newsmen he based the statement on a stack of letters and telegrams expressing opposition to price supports, which were ur urged by a cattleman's caravan sponsored by the National Farmers Union. The union's general counsel, Charles F. Brannan, who was Secretary of Agriculture under President Truman. The biggest manhunt for a suspected murder in the history of New Orleans turned from the cobblestone alleys of the old French Quarter to the Gulf states of Mississippi and Florida. A witness not identified by police told officers he had driven 39-year-old escaped convict Leo Boone from New Orleans to Biloxi, Mississippi. Police said Boone told the witness he wanted to go to Florida. Boone, who fled a Georgia prison camp, being sought for the beating of Mrs. Dorothy Dyson, 
30 of Houston, Texas. The mutilated body of the frail woman found on a blood-soaked bed 12 hours after she had registered as a walk-up hotel with a man identified from photographs as Boone. Four U.S. pilots who made germ warfare confessions while prisoners of the communists in Korea conferred in Washington Monday about new assignments, that from the Air Force. And though some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Wednesday, October 28, 1953, on your radio crime classics. We'll have the conclusion in just a moment here on this uh, Friday. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. On Saturday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we go back 85 years to October 29, 1937, and the Death Valley Days, the Whitney Death Valley Highway dedication, a preview of the opening of the new Mount Whitney to Death Valley Highway, a gourd of water taken from Tulia Inyo, the highest bottle of water in America, body of water in America, to bad water in Death Valley, the lowest point. Lone Bear describes the wetting of the waters. The gourd is carried by an Indian runner, a Pony Express rider, a covered wagon, a prospector's jackass, a stagecoach, a 20-mule team, a steam train, an automobile, and an airplane. That's coming up on uh, Saturday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of Crime Classics, October 28, 1953. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Historical background. We are concerned here with England in the early 1700s. George I sat upon the throne, and the terms Whig and Tory were being muttered and bandied about and chalked on walls. During one February, the great Sir Hugh Burdenny took time away from the Navy, went ashore long enough to invent the side pocket, only to die a year later in the Fijis. And in April, a month which concerns us most, King George put his queen in prison because of her part in the von Königsmark affair. But we are concerned most with a citizen of the time, Mr. John Hayes. We hear of him next on the evening of April 22nd. Two lovers who had never heard of him strolled along the Thames. Stroll. Let's see the air, Doc. No, Thomas. So they strolled on. Mary. Doc. Let's see the air. Oh, no. And on... I like it here beneath the bridge, don't you? Well... See how the shadows lie like lacy web? Where? Yon. Oh. Let us sit and watch and see how they quiver as riding moon, a trail in the sky. Here? Yeah. Just so. Mary. Duck. You are dear to me. Hush. And how to wash this torrent inside me. Fair Mary, fairest and most lovely. And now the blushes to your cheek beneath the moon. Thomas. Yes, Mary. I, too. Thomas. This is an unreality which we see, Mary. A conjugation of shadow and moonlight. And but it has such curly hair. Lacy shadows. And eyes and lips that grin. A head with no body. There in the mud. It'll go away. How can it? It's an abomination. Come... It's not real. It is real. It is not. Go see. Duck. Go see. All right. Well? Go. A head? Of a man. Of a curly-headed man. I knew it. Thomas Ascot, I did not want to come down here in the first place. You made me. You made me. Ahead. Go. So 
they discovered the head in the mud of the Thames. And after they married, they had a lot to talk about. It was the head of John Hayes, all right, but nobody knew it then. Thomas Ascott reported his unusual find to the constabulary, who went to the spot, saw that the lad was indeed a truthful lad, poked about searching for a body to go with the head, failed, and then brought back what had been found to the sheriff's offices. They cleaned and combed the find, known as dressing the head in the trade. Then they mounted it neatly on a ten-foot pole. This was the custom of the day. Whenever an extra head was found, mount it on a pole, exhibit it in the town square so it could be identified. Nobody, however, came forward in the prescribed three days, so Dom Llewellyn was called in. Uh, do that thing you do with glass, Dom, he was told, uh, with heads, and close this one for preservation purposes. And Dom did, with caliper and a secretly fashioned glass and blowpipe. And Tom did. In the meanwhile, back at the home of Catherine Hayes, she's just stepped out of her door on her way to the cheese stall. Mrs. Hayes! <laughs> Mrs. Hayes! Good morning to you, Mr. A marketing? A marketing. Mind you if I go along, if I walk with you. Neighbor who walks alone, neighbors alone. Aye. Wise was the poet who first said that. Mrs. Hayes. Yes? A question. Ninny do. How go your two boarders? A pace. So? Yes. Mr. Wood is an attractive one, wouldn't you say? In truth, I had not noticed. Nonny, nonny, nonny. In truth? I suppose you'll say you have not noticed the prettiness of Mr. Billings. Not at all. Through the goodness of my heart for poor tradesmen, they live in my cellar. In truth, I never see them. And Mr. Hayes, your husband. Of him what? I have not seen him. I heard he has returned from the army, but I have not seen him. No wonder. No wonder? If he is on his way to Portugal, how could you see him? How indeed? But Mrs. Hayes... Yes? So long he was in the army. Then home to such a young and comely as you. Then within four days he offs to Portugal. Oh, restless John. My last words to him as he left. Restless indeed. Huh. Would that my husband were restless like that and off to Portugal. And a cooper like that Mr. Billings about. Some has all the looky. Mrs. Martin shook her head sadly all the way to the cheese stalls. There, she selected a good round Edam and went home and told all the neighbors that John Hayes had hied off to Portugal. And neighbors told neighbors, and everybody was satisfied. For a week. For it was a week later that Mrs. Martin went down to London on a visit to a friend. It was an infrequent trip for Mrs. Martin, and her friend took her around to show her the sights, the finest statuary, the best inns, and on a Sunday afternoon, he took her to see a head, which had been encapsulated by Dom Llewellyn, and which was on exhibition at the Constabulary Museum. And seeing it, Mrs. Martin said this. Why, I do believe I knew that man. And her friend took her to the sheriff, to whom she repeated herself. Well, I do believe I know that man. What man? Why, the man in that room there. The one whose head's in the glass. You know him, you say? Did he? You're certain? Did he? Did he do? Who is he? A neighbor to me. Husband to a young lass. Poor lass. Ah? Poor lass. Barely 17, I'd say. And her husband dead in such a way. Who is she? What's her name? Catherine. Catherine Hayes. And he who you've got, like you've got, is her hubby, dear. John Hayes. I'll be confused, I'll be. How? What's he doing in that room, like he is, when he's in Portugal? What's he doing there, indeed? Madam. I. Will you take me to your neighbor? Didi. Didi, I will. <laughs> Enough of you around, Katie and I. We've got enough of 
both of you around, Katie and I. You. What say you, Katie? You settle it between you. <sighs> Listen to me, Ale House man. I'd as soon slit your gullet as look at you. And I'll do it if you don't leave us alone. Talking. That's all you're good at, Billings. Come to me so I can let the air out of you with a knife. I between you. Yes, who be you? Sheriff of London Town. For what? If you be Mrs. John Hayes, I come to take you with me. For what? To show you of your husband, if he be the one whose head we have. Head? Aye. And, madam? Aye. The two men I espy over your shoulder, may I inquire of their worth? Friends to me. And your husband? I would say so. We will all ride down to London Town. And now, Mr. Wood, I will show you a thing. Come with me. Look, you. <gasps> Who is this man whose head is in this glass? I do not know. Who is this man? I do not know. I swear it. I am a pious man. And when I swear a thing, it is sworn to. And it is the truth. Very well. Sit there. Mr. Billings? Close the door, please. Walk to that table, Mr. Billings, and tell me whose head it is in case there. Mr. Billings? Hi. What have you done with the rest of Mr. Hayes? Mr. Hayes? Did you put an axe in such a way as to sever his head? Me? You. No. Very well. Sit there. (laughs) Mrs. Hayes, please. Is that your husband's head who is on the table? No. You are not looking at the head, Mrs. Hayes. Nor do I need to. For my beloved husband, my strength and my love is in Portugal. Mrs. Hayes. What? Will you look at the head, please? I will not. I will bring it to you so you can see. Do not. For what reason? Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. How can it be my hubby loved John when he is... Pretend, Mrs. Hayes. Pretend he is not in Portugal, and so pretending tell me, is this your husband? No. Are you sure? It is not my husband. Perhaps you need a better look. No, no, it is not John, not him. I hold him by the hair and close to you. Now tell me. John, John, hubby love. Your husband? Yes. Yes, oh, yes. And how got he here? They, they did it. Billings and Wood. Say, liar! No shame and no lies. You, the two of you evil men, killed him and severed his head. Aye, while you fetched a pail to catch his head. And laughed as you caught it. In the name of his majesty, I charge the three of you. Charge them, not me. The three of you. The three of them were tried. Billings and Wood on the charge of murder. Catherine on the charge of petty treason, which was 18th century talk for killing one's husband. All were found guilty. Wood died in jail. Billings was hung in chains. And Catherine... Let me read to you from a journal of the times concerning Catherine. An iron chain was placed about her body and fixed to a stake. On these occasions, when women were burned for petty treason... It was customary to strangle them by means of a rope passed round the neck and pulled by the executioner, so that they were dead before the flames reached the body. 
But the flames leaped so high that the executioner burned his hands so that he could not strangle, so that Catherine Hayes was burned alive. It is interesting to note that a graph of petty treason in England for a whole year after that shows a decided drop before it picks up again. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. John Hayes, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Betty Harford was heard as Catherine, Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Martin, and Alastair Duncan as John Hayes. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Richard Peel, Charles Davis, and William Johnstone. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Mahadwat, India, in the year 1894. We will concern ourselves with a father and son who just didn't get along, uh, to the point where one of them had to go. My report to you will be on Rashi among the crocodiles and the prank he played. Thank you. Good night. October 28, 1953, Crime Classics on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Have a great weekend. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. Stream shows on demand. Find where you can download our shows. Learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. Find our social media links. Contact me. You can even buy me a copy to help us acquire more great classic radio theater programs. Thanks for tuning in. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.